You've been taught that all emotions are valid, that every feeling deserves acknowledgement and processing. The therapeutic industrial complex builds an entire economy around this premise. Validate your emotions, sit with your feelings, name them, claim them, frame them. But what if some of your emotions aren't actually yours? What if the feelings you spend hours analyzing, managing, and medicating are installed programs running in your consciousness serving functions that have nothing to do with your well-being? We are going to separate authentic emotions from parasitic ones. Not because parasitic emotions feel less real. They feel extremely real, but they serve different masters. Authentic emotions give you information about reality. Parasitic emotions give you instructions for maintaining the system. Let's start with what's actually built into human neurology. Fear, joy, sadness, anger, surprise, disgust. These six basic emotions show up across cultures, across development stages, in people who've never been taught what they're called. They're hardwired information systems. Fear tells you there's a concrete threat, not a vague sense of unease about your social standing, an actual threat, something that could harm you physically immediately. The emotion mobilizes your body, you respond, and if you handle it correctly, the fear dissipates. It's functional and it completes. Joy signals that your system is operating optimally, not pride in your accomplishments relative to others, not satisfaction at being better than someone, just direct and complicated pleasure in existence. It requires no audience. Sadness processes loss, something real ended, and sadness facilitates release and uh, reorganization. It doesn't become an identity. It doesn't require endless analysis. It moves through you and eventually completes its function. Anger responds to boundary violations. Someone crossed a line and anger mobilizes defense. Not wrath, the kind of disproportionate rage that seeks to destroy. Just functional anger that says no and enforces limits. Then it's done. Surprise updates your model when reality doesn't match prediction. Brief, sharp, immediate. You recalibrate and move on. Disgust identifies toxicity, contamination, poison. It protects you from what could make you sick. These emotions have concrete triggers. They're proportional to circumstances. They resolve naturally once their function completes. They require no social confirmation. A person alone in a forest experiences authentic fear when encountering a predator. The predator doesn't need to validate their fear for it to function. And fear is an entry point that parasitic emotions hijack and exploit. Shame is fear of rejection. Anxiety is fear without object. Pride is cessation of chronic fear pressure registered as reward. Contempt projects fear onto others. Envy, greed, jealousy presuppose scarcity, which presupposes hierarchy, which runs on that transformed threat. All hierarchies install through direct death threat. While I'm studying the formation of hierarchical societies, the same pattern is consistent. Submit or die. This fear then transforms into cultural code. Shame, pride, contempt, envy, and everything else. Physical threat establishes structure, then gets encoded into social protocols that maintain themselves. The parasitic system organizes this fear exploitation through three structural mechanisms. Hierarchy, shame, and scarcity, which we studied in previous videos. Hierarchy is what creates power imbalance and legitimizes an insane concept that one human being can have control over another human being, falsely declaring it natural and necessary. 
pride, shame, envy, contempt, they all require vertical positioning. Someone's above, someone's below. The emotions keep you focused on status maintenance instead of actual goals. You spend energy monitoring where you stand relative to others instead of doing anything substantive. What triggers pride? Positioning yourself above others in a hierarchy. The emotion requires comparison or an audience, even if that audience is imagined. You can't feel proud in isolation. Pride is meaningless without someone to be better than, which wouldn't make sense without a fear to be worse. And pride never travels alone. Where you find pride, you find contempt towards those below and envy toward those above. Shame is the master control emotion. It installs an internal monitor that never stops. You become your own warden. The system doesn't need to watch you because you're watching yourself, evaluating everything through that imagined external judgment, ensuring compliance before you even act. Shame works the same way as pride, but inverted. You position yourself as defective, as inferior, but the positioning still requires that hierarchy. Shame operates through an internalized external gaze. You see yourself through eyes you imagine judging you. The emotion makes you self-policing. You don't need external control when shame has you monitoring yourself constantly, ensuring compliance before anyone demands it. This topic deserves a much closer look, and I will make more videos on the shame itself, also addressing the false belief that some shame is healthy and necessary. Spoiler, no. There are tribes that don't even have that word in their language. Envy, jealousy, greed, anxiety, they all presuppose insufficiency. Not enough resources, not enough recognition, not enough security. The perception of scarcity keeps you striving toward external goals while preventing satisfaction. You're always reaching for the next thing that will finally be enough, except it never is because the scarcity is structural. Envy responds to others possessing resources you've been taught are scarce not things you actually need, things that signal status in the hierarchy you've accepted as reality. The emotion presupposes that resources are insufficient, that someone else having something means less for you. Jealousy treats relationships as proprietary resources. It's scarcity logic applied to human connection. The idea that someone giving attention elsewhere diminishes what you receive. Chronic anxiety is different from authentic fear. Fear has an object. Anxiety is diffuse threat perception with no concrete target. You can't resolve it through action because the threat isn't real, it's systemic. Deliberate uncertainty maintenance generates that diffuse perception. Narcissists do this at the interpersonal level. Ambiguous communication, constantly shifting goalposts, withholding information you need to make decisions. The system does it at scale. Economic instability, job insecurity, shifting social norms, contradictory messaging about what's required to survive. Uncertainty is a control mechanism. When you don't know where you stand, when the rules keep changing, when information is deliberately obscured, anxiety is the correct response. It's not a malfunction. It's your system detecting that something is preventing you from getting the information you need to act effectively. The system maintains this uncertainty because anxious people are manageable. You're too busy trying to figure out the rules to question whether the game is rigged. The anxiety keeps you reactive, keeps you seeking stability within the framework, prevents you from recognizing that the instability is the point. 
Recent neuroscience gives us the mechanism. Astrocytes, cells that were categorized as support for decades, turn out to actively filter neural signals. They regulate which synaptic pathways get enhanced and which get suppressed. They function as metabolic gatekeepers. That's why everyone who tells you that you just need to change your thinking don't know what they're talking about. When you grow up in a system that constantly activates parasitic emotional patterns, constant status comparison, shame induction, scarcity messaging, your astrocytes optimize your neural architecture to process those patterns efficiently. The brain literally rewires itself to prioritize system congruent signals while filtering out information that contradicts installed patterns. This is why willpower doesn't work. The filtering happens below conscious awareness. You don't decide to feel shame when someone displays contempt toward you. The signal response protocol runs automatically. Your astrocytes have been trained to prioritize that pathway. And these emotions operate as communication protocols between captured subjects. Pride expects shame or envy in response. Contempt expects shame or guilt. When both parties are running the same protocols, the system maintains itself through their interactions. But when someone doesn't respond correctly, when they meet your pride with neither shame nor envy, just neutral observation, the protocol breaks. This is why system-captured people often experience autonomous subjects as threatening. The lack of expected response destabilizes their entire framework. Narcissistic patterns demonstrate complete identification with hierarchical positioning. The narcissist's emotional repertoire is almost entirely parasitic. Pride when status is confirmed. Shame when status is threatened, immediately projected onto someone else. Contempt toward inferiors. Envy toward perceived superiors. Possessive jealousy in relationships. Authentic emotions are either absent or immediately converted to status concerns. Sadness becomes shame. Fear becomes anxiety about status loss. There is no direct emotional processing, only positioning. The manipulation tactics target the three pillars precisely. Love bombing activates pride and creates dependency through artificial abundance, followed by scarcity. Devaluation triggers shame. Triangulation enforces hierarchical comparison. These tactics only work on subjects whose astrocytic filtering responds to parasitic protocols, which is most of us because we were all programmed inside the same system. Autonomous subjects experience narcissistic signals as empty or repulsive. Their authentic disgust response identifies the absence of genuine emotional content. The narcissist reads this as incomprehensible rejection because to them emotional expression has always been status signaling. The idea of emotions that don't serve positioning doesn't compute. In this framework, depression is the absence of authentic emotional signals combined with chronic presence of parasitic ones. When astrocytic filtering blocks all authentic pathways, joy, natural anger, functional sadness, etc., while maintaining parasitic loops, you experience existence without vitality. You feel nothing where joy should be. No anger that could mobilize defense. No fear with a concrete object you could address. But the parasitic system runs constantly. Shame monitors everything. Chronic anxiety maintains diffuse threat perception. Status comparison never stops. Self-evaluation continues without pause. The sense of deficiency persists. This explains why antidepressants show limited efficacy. 
the problem isn't neurotransmitter levels. The problem is systematic blockage of authentic signal processing combined with parasitic pattern reinforcement. You're not chemically imbalanced. Your neural architecture has been optimized for a system maintenance at the expense of autonomous functioning. Standard therapeutic approaches treat parasitic emotions as natural phenomena requiring management. CBT teaches you to reframe shame. Dialectical behavioral therapy teaches you to tolerate distress. Acceptance and commitment therapy teaches you to make room for all your feelings. But if these emotions are installed rather than innate, therapy focused on managing them strengthens the installation. You're not learning to function despite your emotions. You're learning to function within the system those emotions maintain. Real deprogramming would focus on recognition rather than regulation. Not shame is natural, accept it, but shame is a control mechanism, here's how it operates. Not work on your self-esteem, but the entire framework of self-esteem presupposes hierarchical positioning. What would autonomy look like without it? The goal isn't better emotional management. The goal is distinguishing between informational signals and control mechanisms and dismantling your response to the latter. As you might have already noticed, the seven deadly sins, as originally formulated before institutional Christianity co-opted them, map onto parasitic emotions. Pride, envy, wrath, greed, sloth. Early Christian thinkers recognized these as threats to autonomous functioning. They were called deadly because they killed the soul, meaning they destroyed the capacity for genuine spiritual experience. The institutional Christianity inverted the framework. The original diagnostic tool, identifying pride and envy as control mechanisms, became a guilt induction machine. You are prideful, therefore shameful, therefore requiring institutional redemption. This pattern repeats. Liberation movements recognize systemic capture, then institutionalize, then become new vectors for the same control mechanisms. Therapy isn't designed to set you free. It's a multi-billion dollar industry teaching you to adapt to the system more effectively. The distinction between authentic and parasitic emotions is functional, not moral. Authentic emotions provide environmental feedback enabling autonomous action. Parasitic emotions enforce compliance with external frameworks. When you feel fear in response to concrete threat, that's your system functioning correctly. When you feel chronic anxiety about your status, your value, your place in hierarchies you didn't choose, that's installed programming. When you feel joy in direct experience, that's autonomy. When you feel pride at being better than others, that's system capture. When you feel anger at boundary violation, that's self-defense. When you feel shame at existing differently from expectations, that's control. Not all emotions are created equal. Some give you information about reality. Others give you instructions for maintaining your position in structures designed to extract your energy and limit your autonomy. Recognizing which is which is important. Not managing your emotions better or accepting all feelings as equally valid. Recognizing that some of what you've been taught to call emotions are actually system maintenance protocols running in your consciousness. That doesn't mean you're broken. You're just captured. And that's something you can actually address once you see it clearly. Your astrocytes have been trained to prior prioritize the thought with while maintaining parasitic loops, you what? But if these emotions are installed, <sighs> managing them straightens. 
before institutional institutional question. Yeah. 